testing one, two. Okay, so I think we'll get started. My name's Sabrina Hamilton. Um, I will introduce myself more thoroughly in a moment. But I wanted to read you the um, initial prompt for this session uh, when I wrote up a, a session description. And so I think things that will come up uh, may be in here, and I'm sure other things will come up that have bearing on conversations that have already happened today and yesterday as well. Um, so. What I wrote was, and it seems forever ago, is uh, designing for ensemble theater, and in particular for devised ensemble works. So I'm gonna conflate those two things in this session a little bit. Um, holds a unique set of challenges and rewards. Some ensembles have managed to do this extremely successfully, and other ensembles have slash artists, company members, who fill design needs while also performing, writing, or handling other ensemble tasks. Other ensembles wish they had designers as company members, but have talked about the difficulty of finding the right fit. Many designers are interested in ensemble and devised work, but are unable to make a career work centered around work with an ensemble. Other challenges come from the values taught in many of our graduate training programs that are in opposition to the values of many ensemble practices and processes. Designers are taught that the hallmarks of the professional, uh, profession are efficiency, getting it right the first time, speed, the ability to juggle many projects concurrently, and to serve the vision of a single voice, the director. Hands-on work where the technician-designer de divide is breached is deemed less worthy, less professional, as is sticking with an ensemble as they tour. In devised work, designers are asked to be generative artists rather than interpretive artists. Though, inc though increasingly part of undergraduate curriculum, this is not generally taught or given much weight in most graduate programs in the United States. Though it is much more the norm in scenographic training courses in other countries. Designers who are able to work in this way are in so much demand that they often find themselves called upon to serve multiple ensembles. So this session is a round table with company members, with designers, with educators, and with you all. And so we're gonna do a little bit of self-introduction, and we'll start with you. My name is Leon Inglesrud. Uh, I'm a member and one of three co-artistic directors of the City Company. And uh, my background uh, in my training, as such as it is, I uh, left my undergraduate program at the University of Minnesota to join an ensemble uh, called the Suzuki Company of Toga, which is a theater company in Japan that some of you might know about. Uh, and while I was with that company, we, uh, some of us Americans who were involved with it became one of the kernels uh, that formed the city company, which formed as a collaboration between uh, the Suzuki Company's artistic director, Tadashi Suzuki, and Anne Bogart. 
uh, and in my transition from the Suzuki company to the city company, I went to grad school just because I wanted to have some kind of degree, so I felt like I hadn't only run off and joined the circus. Um, but essentially, that is what I did. And so I've been working with the, the city company uh, ever since. I'm spending a lot of time as an actor now, and it's, it's really weird because um, I've never taken an acting class. <laughs> <laughs> um, which I, it's just I, more and more this is seeming weird to me. But so all of my training has been training within ensembles, the, the internal, internal training. And in the Suzuki company, one of the things that really attracted me to it, and one of the reasons why I passionately um, sort of believed in the ethos of that company was there was no division between the categories. Um, Mr. Suzuki used to say, we're just making theater. On any given day, that might mean you're cleaning the toilet, or you're playing the lead role, or you're building the set, or you're hanging lights. We're just building theater, and we're all theater makers. Then, then you start quibbling about what it was. And so as, company, as a member of the company, you were expected to do whatever was necessary. And that created a very different relationship amongst the various sort of production departments. And it was actually a little bit hard in, in adjusting to working uh, back here in the States where it is more siloed. And I can certainly see the advantages of that in terms of developing deeper expertise in each of those fields. Um, but there is something that is lost in that as well, which we can maybe get into more, but that's, that's who I am. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Darren West. I'm a sound designer for the City Company and, and elsewhere. Uh, I graduated from a very small but very effective theater program at Western Kentucky University. And then right after that became the resident sound designer at the Williamstown Theater Festival. It was like the first big gig right after college. And from there I ended up at um, the Alabama Shakespeare Festival for a season, spent some time there doing some Shakespeare, working with some composers, and then uh, ended up at Actors Theatre of Louisville, which I was the resident sound designer there for three seasons, three or four seasons, where I met Anne, and did a couple of shows with her, and then one night after an opening in the bar, she goes, hey, I'm thinking about starting a theater company, and we're gonna do a play about Marshall McLuhan in Japan, would you like to come? I had the summer off because we were regional theater, so I, joined the city company circus and went to Japan and made this play, came back, premiered it in New York, and said, you should move to New York. So I moved to New York in 1993, and here I sit with everyone today. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bob Leonard. Uh, I teach uh, in the Department of Theater and Cinema at uh, Virginia Tech in Blacksburg, Virginia. Um, I came into teaching after uh, I think of it in a sense as my retirement gig. Um, uh, after having uh, started and run a theater ensemble in Johnson City, Tennessee called The Road Company, um, my own background, I've been thinking about these stories and where we all come from. Um, I, I left high school, which was in a private boys school, uh, trying to escape from the constraints of a private boys school, um, and found myself washing dishes in a uh, uh, restaurant on Cape Cod, uh, washing pots and pans. And co coincidentally, the wait staff had all been hired from the Massachusetts uh, Conservatory of Music, um, and they were there to wait on tables and to put on a review in the evening. And they opened it up, and I became a member of that little group of people doing reviews, and that was my start into the theater um, world, which was talk about washing dishes and doing the other thing and doing the other thing. That's where it was. Um, I went to Wesleyan in the College of Letters program, and I voiced a name that I haven't spoken publicly in honor uh, very often at all, but my tutor there was uh, Tommy T. Toshiro uh, in the, what is essentially a comparative lit program. Um, I made theater, but I was outside the theater, and that's been pretty much the way I've done. Um, I uh, went to Catholic University for a couple of years in graduate program, got a job, left the school. Um, and uh, a trainer, if you would, 
a fellow named Jeremy Rifkin, um, a thinker, intellectual a provocateur, uh, who at the time was trying to celebrate the revolution uh, prior to 17, uh, 1976, um, and asked for some theater that might do that. And I found myself uh, making a small project that turned into a career-long um, company. I met Joe Carson in Johnson City, Tennessee, and she gave me insight uh, and, uh, in a sense, the, the whole community of Johnson City, Tennessee was my artistic home, my artistic birthplace. Um, and now I'm able to share some of that in the classroom. And once again, I'm Sabrina Hamilton, and I uh, went to Hampshire College in its early days. And when I uh, graduated from there, I came back to New York where I had grown up and got involved in a lot of, working with a lot of companies, including many years of work with Mabu Mines. Um, I learned my first lighting work by uh, being the last of the manual board ops when the, present, when the producer wouldn't get a computer board. Um, I had a movement background, so I could do a 10 count with my knee and a four count with my elbow. And, um, and uh, learned lighting by doing the rooftops, fire escapes, and balconies on the Halloween parade. Um, and after years of working a lot in international theater, um, particularly with ensembles, not just American ensembles, touring festivals, um, I took a two-year visiting design teaching job at Hampshire College back at my alma mater. And then when the other faculty members went on sabbatical, um, I replaced them, and then there was no one left to be. So then I went to grad school. Um, and I couldn't, I hadn't gone because I couldn't figure out what program to go to. Um, and I finally convinced them to let me be a grad student in both lighting and directing, which is so weird at that point, they had to kick it up to a dean's level. But they finally agreed that I could do a double MFA in two years um, in lighting and directing by getting credit for all the courses I had taught on an undergrad level as having taken on a graduate level. They could do that math. Um, and then I went on from there to teach at Williams College and then went started teaching graduate students at Towson. Now I consider myself a recovering academic. Um, and in the meantime, I started the Co-Festival of Performance, which uses the facilities of Amherst College in the summer. It's been going for 23 years. It's a festival of all original devised work. We teach uh, six-day intensive workshops, rehearsal residencies, and have an internship, uh, an interdisciplinary internship um, each summer. Um, so that is sort of my background. Um, and so I think what we're going to do now is segue into maybe Leon talking about the company. And then one other thing I think that I want to make sure that you know about Darren is <laughs> I was on a panel for the NEA TCG Design Fellowship. And in it, the applicants had to propose what they would do if they got the fellowship, who they wanted to go observe. I cannot tell you how high the percentage of people who decided they wanted to go observe Darren, whether or not they were sound designers. There were costume designers deciding that he was the person they wanted to go observe because of the very special function and way that the city company works. And maybe you can help us learn more about that. Well, it's... Good luck. Yeah. Have a good time. <laughs> I actually I'll did one of here. I my, my MFA is in directing, but I got permission to do one of my internships as Darren's assistant <laughs> <laughs> at the at, at the public. So he asked me to get him coffee one time, and I said, "Darren, I'm not that kind of assistant." But so, um, I got him cocoa instead. Um, but the the, it, the city company is is an, one way to talk about it is that it is an amalgamation of a number of different uh, theater cultures. In that, you know, Anne Bogart, who um, you know, comes out of performance studies, and, and Richard Schechner uh, comes out of um, making theater on the street here in New York and, and in other places, and this um, very sort of downtown um, New York thing that culture combined with sort of um, Suzuki's um, Japanese avant-garde theater making shows in a tiny village 
in the mountains in Japan, very uh, old school, uh, but kind of the classical avant-garde, the 70s, 80s, let's, let's all be Peter Brook kind of thing. Um, that culture, plus a lot of the actors um, and, and Darren were coming out of, to, to some degree, the, the regional theater uh, culture, American culture. And, and these, I think, I think these three are very divergent cultures, and, and they had some, some overlap between them. But in a lot of ways, in this, the city company wasn't originally conceived of as a theater company. The, the acronym city is Saratoga International Theater Institute, and the idea was this was going to be a summer program in Saratoga Springs, New York, that uh, Ann and Suzuki had sort of dreamt up. Suzuki was looking for a context in which to do work in the United States, a context in which to work with some of the artists he had been working with in the United States. Uh, Anne was, had just um, left Trinity Rep, where she had been artistic director for an entire half season. And uh, so she was looking for, for a, different, a different attack, in a sense, that, that just being an artistic director in a regional theater was clearly not the thing that was gonna do it. Uh, and so we came up with this idea of this summer institute, and then who would be the, you know, there would be work presented there, there would be conferences, symposia, who would be the people doing this work? And, the, and obviously from Suzuki's side, it was Suzuki's company and some of the American actors who had been working with him. And, but Anne didn't have her own company. And so in the first year, there was sort of this hodgepodge of people that came together and, and Anne directed uh, Chuck Mee's Orestes. Uh, and it was this very uh, wild and woolly production of it uh, that, didn't, that didn't really fully crystallize. Uh, as as a th thing, so even after that first production, it was we still we're not talking about there being a company, and it was in this in the second year when uh, we had to really pare down because there was less money, and and so Anne really focused in and like it was six actors right mm -hmm. six actors, and and brought in Darren and was really focusing in what what is essentializing this around this production of the medium. And it is impossible to underestimate the importance of Darren's designer role in that process, crystallizing the company coming into being. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, you know, and even in how you said it, it was you were invited to join the company. In a sense, the company didn't really exist yet. Yeah. And, and it, it's sort of like cornstarch, you know, got mixed in, and I, then it I started... I cornstarch. <laughs> and, and that starts gelling it. And this, this, has, this sense has continued. So for, from the standpoint of the city company, to think about our work absent the designers in the company is very strange. And... Um, this goes to another thing that we've been working very hard on in the company, which is to try to maintain a horizontal um, sort of structure where we, we try to make decisions by consensus, which is just shooting yourself in the head and the foot alternately. You're going bang, and then you're going bang, and you're going bang, and then bang. It's just like that's, that's how you move through the world. But you, eventually you're all hitting yourself in the head at the same time and you're all shooting yourself in the foot at the same time and you can call that agreement and everybody goes, wow. Um, but part of that, what that means, when you flatten out the hierarchy and you're saying everybody in the room has the same voice, everybody in the room can express an opinion, it means that a designer, particularly a sound designer, who Sound designer is an incredibly powerful position, in, in, especially if they're in rehearsal all the time. And if you're then creating a situation where you're saying anybody can talk about it, it, uh, it, uh, it cultivates an atmosphere in which that person's aesthetic, that person's ideas, that person's take at any given moment has a lot of sway. If you want to piss off a city company member, tell us that our work is Ann Bogart's. 
I'm including her in city company member in that sentence. It's one of the reasons why we've gone to talking about co-artistic leadership is because we're sick and tired of being Anne Bogart's city company. We have never been that. If you come, I'd say this, I've you know, said this for years and years and years, and if any of you have ever come and observed our rehearsals, you know it's true. I get more acting notes from this guy than I get from Anne. You come in to watch a city company rehearsal, you will think that Darren is directing the show. Because on, the, on a moment by moment basis, he has a lot more to say. And that doesn't mean, sometimes it means Anne doesn't have anything to say, but oftentimes it means he's got a more practical track and he's going on that and we're following that. And then Anne will have something to say about that. And other people will have something to say about that. But the idea, I, I think it's really, really important, and I'm saying this as a director because I know this feeling too, and, and we've worked as director and designer as well in other contexts. You know, Darren said to me once, you should always listen to your designer for the simple fact that they do more shows than you do. They see more things than you do. They've solved this prob problem probably seven times already. <laughs> and you're maybe hitting it for the first time. So you should always at least listen to that. And it's really true. It's, and it's just practical. It doesn't mean you have to do what they say, but you should always take their input. And it mean, you know, the cultural shift, I think, that, that, you know, they, that's part of what is implied by maybe ensemble theaters are important, duh. Um, the cultural shift that's implied behind that is a reevaluating of the hierarchy in the rehearsal process. And, and getting away from this, what I think was a historical aberration of the auteur. Um, and so, you know, we have all of our designers in the company, because we have a, a um, we have Darren, Brian Scott, who's our lighting designer, sometimes set, Neil Patel, who does sets, and, um, James Schuette, who does costumes and sometimes set, they each have a very different relationship with the company. And when they work, they don't always all work with us, with the company on every production. Each one of them has a very, very uh, different kind of role. But that role is not dictated to them by a hierarchical structure. It emerges out of their own way of approaching their work, their own attitude towards the company, their own personal relationship to us, and it's an organic, hopefully, thing. It's not, here is the designer's role in the process. And it's, you know, we have, we have this gesture that we do in the company, which is, in one form or another, you, you pump a shotgun. And what it means when you, when you do this is it means, I'm about to say something, and y'all are welcome to shoot it down. <laughs> which I, it's it actually a really, really useful thing because you have to create an environment, and, I, and this goes to, you know, it's the hardest thing, I think, to do in educational situations because you have to, you have to somehow teach this to young artists that you have to, when theater making, create a situation in which anybody can say anything they want, but some of what you say is going to be stupid and we're going to shoot it down. Being able to say anything and everybody having the right to speak doesn't mean everything everybody says is worthwhile. <laughs> Collaboration is not about getting along or agreeing. Collaboration is about making something together. We fight like cats and dogs sometimes. And I remember once we were working on a production and, and we were just at loggerheads about it. And this was with, we were working with graduate students and professional actors and, and undergraduates. It was this really mixed situation. And I had, you know, I talked to the grad student, or to the undergrads who were like confused because dad and mom were fighting. And it was like, you know, it's, we, we still love each other, you know. It's like, because Darren and I would go at it about a, a, about a moment, and it's not necessarily a sound moment, it might be an acting moment. And then we go out and, you know, have a beer and some oysters. It's, you know, it's, that's part of the process, and we, and we knew that. And I said to them, what you're hearing in that argument is a multi-decade relationship, you know, just going through something. And it's valuable, you should fight. 
when there's a fight. Mm -hmm. And just, and valuing consensus and valuing agreement and valuing collaboration doesn't mean bending all the time. You know, it's, it's a lot more complicated than that. And that's, that's a tricky thing to teach, I think. It's a, and and I, th I don't know, I may be wrong, but I don't think there's a way to teach it outside of an example. You just have to put, it in, put people into that situation. But it's really, really powerful when you let somebody say something that you think is really stupid, and then you say, great, that's good, and get your own show. <laughs> and if you want to do that, make your own company and make that show, because that's not what we're going to do here. As opposed to, you don't have a right to talk, right. wait until you're older, you know. So, Darren, how, does, how is this different from the other models that you've worked in? What, what draws you to this? Why, why are you in this room again and again? Uh, well, I actually ended up there completely by accident. I mean, you know, I had done a lot of regional theater work, a lot of Shakespeare work, a lot of typical theater with a capital T. And, but the thing at Actors Theater of Louisville, because of the Humana Festival, there was a lot of exposure to brand new plays that had never been done before, that we were looking at black and white on a, on a page and, and bringing that to life. And something in me, even from college a little bit, I thought, I don't want to do the plays that have been done before. I want to help make new plays. So that was always sort of where my head was oriented. And it was a very simple thing. Like, at, at, a, at the time that I came along, sound designers were sort of just beginning to figure out how exactly we do our jobs. Mm -hmm. And everybody came at it from, from different points of view. You know, if you had this conversation with John Gramada, he was a composer first that decided that a way to get his music heard was to, to, to do it in, in the context of theater. I came from a theater background via a recording engineer kind of happening simultaneously and a professor in college at Western said, oh, we're doing this very complicated sound show and uh, we think you should be the sound designer on it. And at that point in 1986 or whenever that was, I didn't know what a sound designer was, frankly. But I was the only guy in the theater department that understood how all the sound worked, how the, how the console worked even more than the professors did just because that was what my life was up to that point. And so in the process of doing that show, I thought, oh, this brings two things together for me in a really amazing way that I've always had a really deep love for the theater and the collaboration of a group of people in making something and this other technical side of uh, uh, sound and music having the ability to be dramaturgical. And I think if there was anything that I sort of started uh, or can say I, I, I helped start is the idea of thinking about sound not as an icing that's put on the cake after the cake is made. Uh, I'm actually in the kitchen going, oh, what if we put a little more sugar here? You know, that, that the, the sound design is a part of the DNA of the piece that's being made. So it was really simple. I was in rehearsals at Actors Theater and I would find that I would go to watch a run through because there's a typical way that it's done. They do a designer run, the designers come, they sit at the table, they take their notes, the director leans over and whispers things. We all know how, that's, how that works. So I would go back to my studio on the other side of the building and create what I thought might be the perfect sound cue for this particular sequence. When I got back to the rehearsal hall the next day or later that afternoon, the DNA of the scene had changed. And I just thought, this is crazy, why don't I just Oh, and this was sort of the dawn of sound actually becoming portable. Um, so it was a simple thing. I called my assistant and said, let's, for Humana, we're moving my entire, stair, uh, my entire system from the studio into the rehearsal halls, and we're just going to schlep it back and forth show between show. So the way I started designing was really practical, and I also had very limited time. So this, so it was efficient too, just as a designer that I'm making something, I know it's gonna work. If, it, if I need to tweak it a little bit, I'm in the room with it to tweak it while they're working on it, rather than making something and then having to spend time at home working. So for me, I got so much more sleep. Um, <laughs> because I wasn't sitting up all night doing notes after tech. The, when I arrived at the tech rehearsals, the show was done because the, the transitions were, 
were worked on v musically and the way the music worked in the scene when they opened the door on, the, uh, on that cello phrase. It had all been sort of worked out. So it was a continuous composition, which is how I've always sort of thought about the theater. So then one afternoon, this woman, Ann Bogart, came to Humana and a friend of mine was the stage manager on the show, and he called me in the office. It was for a production of Edward Wardo Machado's Eye of the Hurricane. Called me and said, you have to come over to the rehearsal hall right now to see what this woman is doing with sound. And at that point, Anne came in with stacks of records and CDs, and she was having the stage manager pointing out things, and they had post-it notes on them, and, and they were playing things in the room. But the way she was integrating how music was working was exactly the way my brain was working at the time. And I was, you know, you walk in a room with John Jory and try to do that. You're a little bit trying to put a square peg into a round hole, but God bless him, he put up with me and let me do it. Um, but then to stand in that room with Anne, I thought, oh my God, I want to work with this woman. And so we, I, I ended up getting into rehearsal as much as I can on that first Humana show, and then we did a, a number of shows later, and something just clicked. And the day that I, she didn't come in with all of her CDs and her albums, I thought, okay, I'm getting somewhere here. So for this production of Picnic, I was, it, it was in rehearsal the entire part of the process. They, there was a band, you know, in Picnic, there's Ernie and his band that play or, or over the top of the hill that you hear every once in a while. So I was referred to as Ernie, um, <laughs> right down to them buying, the costume designer buying me a pair of two-tone shoes to wear, old 50s two-tone shoes to wear. But, you know, I was sitting in the room with samplers and reel-to-reels and, and making the play, um, you know, a, a, as we went. So my process, even to this day, doesn't really change from if I'm working with City or if I'm doing punk rock, which I'm in tech for now down at the Lortel. It's all the same process. So the only difference for me is, is how I deal with the director and sort of how the bedside manner works from one thing to the other. But if it's a Broadway show, if it's, uh, if it's some off-Broadway thing at the Cherry Lane, like my process is my process. Um, but I do think, you know, the, the advantage that you have working inside a, a, an ensemble uh, more often than not is just the shorthand that, that you have between, between one another. And you get more time to really try your really extreme ideas you know, in a safe environment. You know, I, I can do things in the room with Ann and the company that I can't do in a room with Joe Mantello. You know, I have to have a certain sort of preparation. And it's basically just sort of about figuring out what piece of the pie you have in the creative process. Because I think, you know, most of the time, so many young, especially young designers, sound designers, I, I can only speak for sound designers, but they, they come into a room thinking they have to prove that they have to be there. You know, this thing that, that every cue has to be right and perfect and, 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 and a part of the process. And my whole thing is about integrating uh, uh, in such a way into the room that I learn what the director is looking at, I learn what the actors are working on, and I figure out what my job needs to be in a particular circumstance. So sometimes it's about coming up with an underscoring to help uh, an actor figure out a scene, and sometimes I'm looking ahead for the director to go, oh, I think this transition needs to be this tempo. So it, 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 the role that I have in a room every single day changes, which is part of the reason I love it. You know, I love that job so much, but I don't know if that explained anything, but. This is a, a real quick tag on that. I, I did a production of Samuel Beckett's Endgame one time, and I wasn't sure if I wanted any sound in it, and so I asked Darren if there was going to be sound on it, would he design it? And I was like, yeah. And so we'd, we had did a meeting and came to the conclusion that it shouldn't have any sound in it. And he talked me out of him working on the show, essentially, by, by us agreeing artistically that it didn't need any sound. I wasn't allowed to credit lack of sound design by Darren <laughs> West, but that, I, I that's wanted to. That's my favorite lighting design was <laughs> doing a piece by Natural Light, and I said, begin it five minutes earlier. And it'll time out perfectly. But that's good design, um, I yeah, think. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this is not a new conversation to net, uh, but it's, it's growing. But there was a, a, a very beginning seed of this conversation up in Maine at a net gathering underneath a tree. 
Bob Leonard was there and he said a key thing that just comes up because of what you said, Darren, which is what about stage managers? And you had just been named as head of teaching stage management in your university. And you were talking about that person sitting next to Anne with all the sticky notes on mm -hmm. the stuff. Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, about the whole stage management interface in this well, yeah. world? Well, um, yeah. I was just thinking what, what Darren just said is interesting to me from the point of view of stage manager. Uh, my process is the same whether I'm here or there. Well, that's a really interesting reality um, because here or there are very different processes. And um, I have, just a little background, <clears throat> before I found myself able to direct plays, I was stage managing and um, I thought that there was a natural progression. You stage manage for a while, and then someone comes along and says, okay, now you're ready to direct. Um, that's, I did believe that. When I found out that wasn't the case, I stopped stage managing um, because I was he uh, uh, headed in my mind towards directing. Um, so when Virginia Tech uh, finally came to me to fill in uh, behind a couple of folks before me who had been teaching stage managing. I had had some association with stage management, but a long gap. <laughs> I had, as I thought about stage management, oftentimes thought that stage management is fundamentally personnel management. Um, and that's what I was thinking under that tree. Uh, but having taken on this matter of teaching stage managers um, out of my own experience in a wild, you know, random uh, kind of career. Uh, I've come to a place where I think now that the stage manager is the manager of the creative process. Um, and I think that is uh, much more challenging, much more interesting to really get into uh, than, the, than the apparent uh, interest in one uh, personnel management or you know getting in between people who are fighting um, uh, or being the, the uh, resident documentarian making sure everybody does according to the way the director said you're supposed to do and carrying on with the reports and getting stuff out to the management and all that stuff. Um, so the curious dynamic that will happen and does happen inside of ensembles and outside of ensembles is that each project begins to develop its own culture. How the, how the ensemble in itself is different from, from the last project, why choices have been made to make this project this way, that all colors and shapes the nature of the, of the creative process. And the stage manager is asked to manage that blind, right? You don't know what you're gonna get. And how do you allow yourself to be open to listen is probably one of the most important stage management jobs that you could list. Um, how you can hear in an ensemble when, you're, when you know people well, how can you hear the difference between this time and last time? What's going on in the actual exchange? Whether it's great fellowship or terrible fights, what's happening here is a stage manager's province. Listening and then becoming able to help that process, to work on that process. So um, at Tech, this is what I bring to the students I work with. There's not an easy answer. I'm not going to present a, a textbook approach to how you do rehearsal reports. Um, it is about that, asking that question all the time with whatever process may be in place inside the university's pro production schedule. That's, that's where I'm coming from. That's what I think about this, the, the matter. Um, and <clears throat> to a large degree, in a sense, this is going to be the same, as you say, whether I'm working on an ensemble or working with uh, you know, a jobbed in uh, production unit. Um, yet the stage manager's job is to suss that all out, which makes everyone different. I'll just leave it at that. 
I, I think that's really interesting because we've gotten to the point where finally the Academy is recognizing first, I think, the actor creator as opposed to the actor interpreter. We've gotten to that point now. Now there's this other step of maybe the designer creator and what's I think probably quite radical for most of your departments is the stage manager creator. Mm -hmm. Are you <clears throat> invoking that model? Um, so what I'd like to do now is to open it up to you all and to talk a little bit about the situations you find yourselves in. Um, what are the successes in this? What are the obstacles to this? What do you want the collective wisdom in the room to brainstorm on? What problems can we solve? And take this conversation a step further. Yes. So, we're gonna give you a mic because we're live streaming right. and there are a number of people who are following this. So we wanna make sure that you get mics. Is there a, that, that extra mic? There is not that extra mic. There are where? It's on oh, the okay. We're gonna pass these around. Wow, it's just like Oprah. Yeah. It's... So I, I would love to listen to you all talk. Um, I work in a collaborative theater company as well. We've been together for 10 years. We have that shorthand language. We're starting to get that language with designers, but we're also starting to try and implement it um, in professional training programs with, and I'm going to say this because I know we're all family, the American Repertory Theater is dead, but everybody's still training designers that way. So the big problem that we have with student designers is they're intrigued by this process, but what's, what's given to them educationally is about their portfolio, is about their book, is about following on this four week or four week or six week process, or sometimes two week, two and a half weeks, three weeks process. How can we get designers, in your opinion, young designers especially, to start thinking in a different way about that problem? And what can we do at a university level to try and make those innovations, to try and say, okay, let's look at the theater of today and tomorrow and not what has been. Well, I think you have to get designers in the room, you know, that you have to rejigger the schedule in such a way that y you can intellectually design all you want to on, on paper, but the real job, like 80, I'd say 89% of the job is, is bedside manner in learning how to actually know when you should say something and 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 know when you shouldn't you know and and how you know we interact together you know i i find that the way we talk about what we're doing while we're doing it is really really super important that it's a it's a there's a big difference between me walking into a room and having a conversation with the director about what i think this piece of music might be under this monologue rather than coming in and saying, I had this great idea, here's this thing that I wanna try, rather than walking in going, hey, been thinking about this scene, what if we dot, 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 dot. Like, uh, for me, the syntax of inclusion is huge, especially yeah. for designers. And if we can figure out a way that designers in the room feel confident enough that they're not having to prove why they're there for the job. I tell this to designers all the time. I don't think I actually said this when I was thinking about it earlier, but most of the time, especially with young designers or with my assistants, I frequently go, relax, sit back, stay in the gray area for a little while. It's okay that you don't know the answer to the, to the question. If somebody asks you, hey, do you have a great idea for this transition? You say, not yet, but I'm going to. That, that you, you've already got the job. So the thing about it is for me, and rehearsals are really, really hard work, especially for a sound designer, because eight hours a day you're listening. And, and, and you're listening in such a way that, that, you're, tr that you're trying to um, uh, uh, help storytelling. And sometimes something that you design on a given day doesn't work the next day. Or you get to tech and you go, the, um, on the show I just got done doing, there was um, a day that we were rehearsing that the gigantic storm was going on outside in the room. And we rehearsed the whole show and everything was influenced by the, the dark clouds of that day and the storm. And then we got over to the theater and something wasn't right. And I was like, hold on a second. Whipped up a storm, put it in the scene, 
set it with the music, and then all of a sudden things seem to make sense. And then we could look at that and then evaluate, okay, now is this an issue just from rehearsal, or does this phenomenon actually help us tell the story of this particular scene in the play? You know, I, I think the, the thing about it is, is that des designers feel like once they make a decision, that they have to stick to that decision. And what I've constantly said is, make the decision. Like, d put it out there, sit in the hot seat and go, this is my bold idea for the opening of Richard, y y you know, of whatever show that you might be working on. And then, after you've made it, the hard job is to then sit back in the room, play that thing, pull yourself away from it and go, does this really work? You know, that, the, and, and if it doesn't, make something else. You know, that's the, that is the thing about being able to work in an ensemble situation and having a, uh, having a given time. You, you can talk about it all you want in a classroom, but until you put designers in a room with a director learning how, with all of the egos and all the personalities, you know, I, I have to interface with the director differently depending on who the director is. And that is a skill. It's probably one of the more important skills you have to have as a designer. You know, anybody can make an awesome sound cue, especially now. I mean, you guys could go home with GarageBand and make a top 10 record, you know. Um, so the, the thing about it is, is what you're designing or being a designer, especially sound for the theater, is not necessarily about the product itself that's coming out of the speakers. It's a lot about what you've done to shepherd that thing through the play to help tell the story to get it into the room. It's, it's a different way of thinking about what your job is, rather than coming in a room thinking about, I have to solve all these problems. That's, you know, to, to sit back and see what the show was telling you to do, and then do that. It's interesting because I think that's something that we put into our actor training, and one of the things that I think is an advantage to a lot of programs is that everybody has to do a certain amount of, of everything. So one of the things, strategies that I think is interesting is to remind designers or sometimes reminding actors of the way that the other folks think. So that moment of being present, the idea of yes and, is not just for improvisational actors. No, perhaps it is for designers just as much, that moment of waiting and listening, that creative listening. You, you, you know, when we, uh, and designers often think that the director should sort of n n know how to tell <laughs> them that that sound cue is wrong. <laughs> you, you know, and I always say, it's not their job. That is your job. Then, you know, if you have a disagreement, you know, Leon talks about how, how many, you know, that we have had our share of disagreement. But the thing about it is, is that you have to put the thing out. And if Leon disagrees with it, you're talking about the thing that's out there. And so then the, the, your, the designer's job is, is you know, the, there's a thing that happens is that when you have a disagreement with a director or with an actor or any sort of situation when you're collaborating, that a door sort of opens a little bit. You can either, as a sound designer, go, oh my God, I stayed up eight hours and built this thing. It is the most genius sound cue in the American theater, <laughs> and they don't understand me or my work, and you can close the door. Or you can go, I wonder what it is about that particular sequence that they don't like, and you walk through the door, and you play the thing, and you stand together and go, is it the sound of the wind? Is it the fact, is it the tempo of the music? You know, sometimes the, the interpretive job of getting notes from a director is, is simply, oh, that was just too loud. I had a 15 minute conversation with Trip Coleman last night about a ghost sequence in punk rock going, yeah, just the, the tonality of it, I, I think, I, I, and the only thing we did was we turned it down literally 2 dB <laughs> and slowed the whole sequence down. <laughs> he just didn't want to hear the bright part of the cue right as the ghost was raising up. But it, 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 so, you know, as a designer, your job is to interpret what that note means, not necessarily to do what they've asked you to do. Because I could have gone down the road having to redo that entire sequence because Trip didn't like it. But the thing about it was, was I loved the cue, so now my job is to, is to collaborate and figure out how my idea of what this moment is meets with his idea. And it was simple as 
turning it down 2 dB and slowing it down. And then when I showed him, when we redid the scene, he goes, that's great. I just didn't want that thing there when he, when he, raised, when he raised up. I'm like, okay. And in my head, I'm thinking, God, I wish you could have told me that two hours ago. But he can't. He doesn't have the tools. He's not a sound designer. He's a director. It's also, though, sorry, that, that if in it, this idea of what are you doing to tell the story, what are you doing to help, move the thing along leads you inevitably to integrating with the other things that are going on that as as the sound designer you're you're not just dealing with the sound design you're looking at what are the lights also doing what is the costume doing is if that's already telling the story maybe i don't have to do as much there big or, time or if <laughs> there's lights if you know there's a situation and the light just isn't doing something it was trying to do and i and you hear this happen all the time where darren will go i think i can solve that problem for you let me try or vice versa where brian will go i think i can get that with the lights and yeah. and but we're all trying to tell a story and it's it, they the various elements need to be integrated. One of the ways that Mabel Minds always articulated that in their process was thinking about the show as having tracks, multiple tracks. And sometimes the job of a certain element, be it sound or light or text, can be to be telling the story. The other tracks then may be counterpoint. It may be uh, harmony. It may be um, distance. It, so thinking it through that way as having parallel tracks with nothing at the outset being presumed to be hierarchical um, as opposed to the standard play where you have that fixed text is something that often, if presented in a, in a classroom situation, I think opens up the room for people who, who may have very different kinds of talents or sensibilities to react to. The word that was used earlier in a session was the prompt, that initial prompt for the piece. Um, and so there, there's, there's space created um, that way, and that the, it's not just the weight of the actors have to do all the work and everybody else will support, or the playwright has to do all the work and everybody else will help realize that, um, that, that it can bounce around. And I think that sometimes, when that's brought into training, um, uh, can be a, a way to get to that. So I wanted to yeah. just respond quickly to this. Virginia Tech is struggling with this massively. Um, and the question has to do with um, hmm, changing. <laughs> um, and in a university, in my experience, um, there are a lot of things that are fairly set. Um, and one of them has to do with the autonomy of the classroom, that the teacher is the teacher in the classroom. There's a culture about that. Well, if that translates also into making theater, that the designer is the designer, or the stage manager is the stage manager, and that there is a kind of um, siloing, if you will, of the body, that doesn't mean that we're not collaborating. We're making work together. So we're, we're struggling with this matter of how do we collaborate? which gets at some much more deeply rooted ways of doing that are difficult to change, very difficult to change. You've got to confront one another about things that have been established and assumed uh, in order to, for all of us to get along more moder moderately well. And um, for, a lot, for people to be in it for the long haul, a lot of systems, particularly in educational institutions and in regional theaters, have evolved so that people do not burn out. Right. So you brought up earlier in the conversation, Sabrina, one of the big matters that we're struggling with at Tech is making the stuff, the shop, the sequencing of getting it all done. Because oddly, the training in a, in a usual uh, environment of the university um, is mixed between producing the work and teaching. So in some ways, we're always producing on the extra on the, on the borrowed time, after we've done the day's work, which is a hell of a bad way to go about it. Right. Um, but it means that we set up mechanisms so that we can accomplish that without killing ourselves. Um, and there is in the shop a certain sequence of stuff, and you're working on this one, then you're going to work on the next one. You're going to forget about the one you just done. No time for a reflection because we're going to move right on. So all those questions come into play when we start talking about actually 
investigating new ways of doing. I just need to get that into the, because I think it's part of your question. You know, there's, a, there's something that's happening now, for me anyway, but only in much larger uh, theater situations uh, like Lincoln Center or the public that say I'm doing a new Sarah Rule play that in the summer, you know, they always do these stage readings, they always do workshops, especially if the play has a puppet with the actors and the stage manager. But the thing that was different about this last process at Lincoln Center was the workshop that happened for the play included every single designer. And we were six months out. So we had a very good uh, uh, time to take a whack at what the set might be to help make this story sort of work. And I was in the middle of it thinking we should do this every single show. That the first time the group of people gets together with the playwright and the acting company, everybody sat around the table for a week and did table work. And then on the weekends, we had designer-only sort of sit-downs where we chatted about, well, what if the floor was this? And we looked through Tibetan art books. And we, that it was, um, you know, it, it's, 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 backing the process up because we definitely understand, you know, that at a certain point in time, a set's got to be designed, it's got to be built, even when you're collaborating on something new, ensemble-based, whatever. But, you know, in the situation where it's a, where it's a play that's being um, uh, uh, created from nothing, the designer, be it scenic, be it costumes, still has to take in the account that, you know, you've got to have some flexibility in the design. You know, it, 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 if... You, you know, if you're a designer that's doing a, uh, a show that's going to be self-created and you want to build this monstrosity of a three-level set that all of a sudden doesn't work later, <laughs> you know, that, that ha some of that falls on the designer themselves, you know, not, not creating for this, not designing for the situation, if that makes sense. So that calls know. for a bunch of time. It does. A commitment of time on the part of the designer. And what I'm learning is in this conversation just here this weekend is the degree to which the designer is being trained to, to be doing five projects or seven projects at the same time and never mind about being in rehearsal. Well, it's, it's obviously uh, uh, impossible to imagine that casting an actor and, saying, and the actor saying, well, I've got several other things I'll be doing. So I won't be in rehearsal until opening night um, or, or until tech rehearsal. Um, that's unthinkable. But you know what? That used to be done. There was a time in the theater where the principals would show up uh, two days before the Opera. show. Opera. Yeah. Let's um, go to Lisa, so, and then we're going to go there. Thank you. I wanted to say first one thing is that it's actually much easier on it. I'm a director. I have a company, and I run a program for performance creation at the University of Minnesota. And I can tell you, my, my sound designer is Vinnie Oliveri, who you probably know, yeah, who you worked well. with, yes. Yeah. And w we work together, he's in the room the whole time, whenever I can afford it, right? And all yeah. my designers are. So I know for a fact, and it's because I'm lazy as a director, why would I want to have to have nine conversations to catch mm -hmm. you up on right. everything we figured out over the three weeks you were gone? Right. It's so much easier. Yeah. So at the university level, this is my question, and I want to hear from anybody. It's, for me, it's a question about how do you help risk happen when you're under, particularly for stage managers, it seems that American theater has gotten terrified of anyone hurting themselves or doing something dangerous. And I'm acting facetious and obnoxious because we just had... Um, Ludko Ripka was here from Contour's original company, and she did a piece on our students. And because she's who she is and she's Polish, I went to see her little showing, and there's like unsturdy ladders that lead to nowhere and actors balancing on them and glasses being thrown, right? Because she's Polish and that's how they do it. And it was in the little X theater where no one has to worry about rules. And I went across the hall to my tech for a huge musical. I asked for a child actor, or I think it was actually a student actor, to carry a lamp that was already plugged in and on so that we could see it move into the stage. And suddenly nine managers got up and had to make sure that it was safe. And because the actor might be an idiot and electrocute themselves. And I just found it very strange. You can't take a step without somebody talking about all the rules that go around it. We had $1,000 in cash on stage, and they literally had to treat it as a weapon. 
they had to lock it up in a weapons box every night, you know. It's this kind of paranoia about safety, and I just wondered if anybody, and I understand the need for it, I don't want people getting hurt, but I, I work in Russia a lot, and geez Louise, I mean, <laughs> there's no one, you know, they really want to risk their bodies and their souls. They don't want to be safe all the time. And I'm just wondering if any of you has anything to say on that, and how we can help train designers, stage managers, actors who are not fitting into a system that is trying to keep them all cushioned? The, I, one thing that I would say is there's, in, there's two kinds of risk that come to mind. One is, is literally risking your physical harm, but the other is sort of aesthetic risk or ego risk. And <clears throat> thinking and, and listening to to both of what you were saying, I had a conversation with Robin Wagner once, and, and he said, you know, if you're really, really lucky, you understand a show during previews. Right. And, and he said, but usually it happens a couple nights after opening. And he said almost everything that he's done with a couple of exceptions, including Chorus Line, he said, um, but just about everything else, he's felt like after it's open, when he goes back to see it, it's like, now I get it, now I'm ready to design it. I want to throw it all away because it's about that one thing there. That's the one thing that we were right about. The rest of this is actually unnecessary. It cost us $12 million to get to that point, but now I want to turn around to the producers and say, thank you very much, can we put it in the dumpster? I now know what it is. So what's that's, that's, yeah. you know, that's a form of danger. And, and he's, the, the, what, he, what he said was, this will stop being an art form when people stop risking that conversation. What's As interesting is that, is that regional theaters are now starting to maybe think about and beginning to bring in ensembles to devise work in, a, in the slots where they used to have a playwright come in. And the first thing they discover is that they need more than an outlet and an internet signal on their laptop. They actually need a space and they need stuff. Well, you know, I, I, completely hear, thrown away. I completely hear you about that. But I think it's on the ensemble's d head to interface with that building. I think it's arrogant of us to feel like the city company can walk into Actors Theater of Louisville and it operate the way we inherently, or, or it, yeah, or any place, you know, wh th that they inherently operate the way we need them to operate. There's a certain learning curve that has to happen. Absolutely. You know, I do these location shows with Liz Lerman and her company a lot, and they make great demands on the local crews. And believe me, I've worked with a lot of local crews, IA guys. You know, and when you are at Yerba Buena and you walk in and go, okay, there's a dumpster of dirt coming, um, you know, the local crew just looks at you like you're a lunatic because they know they're going to be shoveling dirt. But the thing that she does that's so genius is she gathers everyone together from the first day, everybody in the room, and downloads what this event we're going to be doing here at Yerba Buena or in Chicago uh, with everybody, the technicians, and she has a way, and our jobs are, is to bring them into our story. We, they, we don't, and, and what we have found, or what I find f frequently, are, are most of the people that are working in these house situations, are, it's a rote thing. If you come in and shake it up, and shake it up with generosity with them, they will totally go on the ride with you. You know, they will do the crazy fly thing that you, that you need to, to do in, in a particular sequence with the guys up on the fly rail if they know who they're doing it for, what it means in the show, and how important it is. I get, I, I, and they'll do it better I, than you ever dreamed. And they will do it better of. than you've ever imagined. I think, I think one of the things that... Um, came up for me when you asked that question um, has to do with, at the training end of this, we're listening to stories in the, in the full-blown practice, um, is how do young people manage to get through the process of actually learning what they can do? So one of the things that I noticed is that, oh, we got a smoke machine. So for the next five productions, we had smoke. Didn't make any difference we needed smoke or not. But, <laughs> But we had smoke, and, and it had to do with technicians who didn't know how to run it and give them the opportunity, and, and where, what's the timing of it, and what do you do with the smoke when, you get, you know, when you're done with it, and all those questions that come up. Um, but that's also true for stage managers. 
I don't necessarily know as a stage manager, particularly young stage manager, what it is I'm supposed to do. So if you give me, oh, I'm in, I'm in charge of safety. So now I'm going to be in charge of safety, whether it's needed or not, for, for a while. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, so part, of the, part of the challenge to, to, the, to the teacher has to do with how do you allow for the investigation to happen and also to temper it with, with the reality of the need. Of in that the, overall view of the, that whole thing of looking at the whole ecology, yeah. I think that word and that that idea of ecosystem is becoming more and more interesting. Because the other thing I observe a lot is the uh, resource grab that happens in production processes all the time. Whether it's going to be time in the space, or is it going to be I need this much of the budget, or how many can I have and where can I hang them all, um, or cover your butt lights? You know, let's put some cover your butt lights into the plot and and. Uh, you know, uh, I remember talking to Joanna Colitis, I, you know, I'll, I'll ask her five nudities so that I can, you know, give up three and have two, um, which is all I really need. But that whole way of, of, of protecting one's domain so that one does not look bad or perhaps looks better than the rest of the production at the production tanks. Um, how do we get people out of that mentality? And I think that idea of investing in the whole project right. that you you sign on to the project and then within the and that's your primary thing and then you have that other role or roles within that and, and one thing I, i'm th thinking of a t time when i was i was on the faculty at lsu um in baton rouge for a while and we had a series of a fairly common thing of student produced works that were curated by the department that we gave them some resources but it was it was sort of their their show and they would they would make proposals, and then there was a committee on the faculty that uh, I was a member of, and we would pick. Okay, here are the here are the eight shows we're going to do this year. And one year after we'd made the selection, it is, well, it happened every year. But the, the students who had not been picked would come into my office and they'd be upset and wanted to do the show. And I got really frustrated with them <laughs> once, and I said, w "If you wanted to do this show." why on earth would you let us stop you? The only thing that's been told to you was some faculty members at a land-grant university said you can't do your show. You are not a theater artist if that's gonna stop you. So go out and make the show. If you really wanna do it, otherwise, what were you doing? Were you just, did you, is your life dream to be in that series of student-created work? No, you, if you wanna make the show, make the show. What I started to find was that those productions, because a couple of them did do it, they ended up, like the, their relationship with their, because then they had to go to, their, to the, the, the lighting designer and say, like, where could we do this? And you know, they had to figure things out on a fundamental level that was so much more um, holistic and healthy, and they got, I think they got so much more out of it. And, and I've sort of been paying attention, the people who did that are actually, some of them are still working. You know, they're still actually making, because they had to solve some fundamental problems that we were actually not making them solve when we took them on and supported them. Like, huh. It's all about a, an investigation and inquiry and practice of power. It really comes down to that almost every time. And how we bring young folks into the negotiation of power, if it's not thought about, can be the most wicked of constant repetition of the way we think it ought to be. And, and it results in a huge amount of disempowerment, absolutely. Yes. Um, this question of resources is really interesting because for me as an ensemble practitioner and a really early career practitioner, um, I'm often um, in situations where I'm, I'm expecting something to be like as threadbare as possible basically. And that's where I find the challenge with bringing designers in the room because as others have mentioned, um, you know, designers that are used to working freelance, are used to working several shows in different contexts, are used to working in a specific way. And so to say, you know, oh no, we don't really have access to the space more than a couple hours, you know, beforehand, or we only have access to these instruments, or you know, um, what have you. It, it, that's kind of a difficult way, and I, I'm wondering how you all manage to work in these ensemble contexts to sort of bridge those conversations that might be different than 
for example, if you're working in a regional house or so on, and you're actually having a more concerted, you know, budget conversation with the production manager and kind of that process, which is completely separate. You, you know, I, it was funny. As you were speaking, I, I thought, d uh, stop thinking about your designer like a technician. Don't go to your lighting designer and go, hey, can you do my show, but I only have eight Lecos. Like, go to your designer and go, I'm going to make the most awesome piece of theater from my soul, and I want you to work on it with me. So it's about the pitch, is what you're saying. Like, the actual, like, the it actual, is, like, work, well, what you want, but what, what you want to find are people with a like mind of yeah. aesthetic no, I totally agree. Yeah. To, to do something with you. It doesn't make any difference whether we're doing it here or we're going to do it in the stairwell. You know, like what, 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 you're look, what you're looking at is somebody to put in your toolbox that you can stand in the room with and that will think about the other parts of the thing that you're working on for you and with you. It's a very different, it's a very different thing. And I'm telling you, designers will do it. They're dying to do it if you let them do it. But sometimes there's a little translation time that is needed because we are not learning each other's languages. That, that's very true. You know, I, I have gotten in situations, it doesn't happen so much anymore, but, but I used to find myself in situations with directors who did not know how to speak to me because I was working in the rehearsal hall. And I just always said to them, talk to me as if I was an actor. Instantly put them at ease. You could talk about the intentions of the scene. They, I think they thought that, that they needed to be smarter and were scared of me. And, and, and I'm thinking, I'm thinking about the show like an actor. I'm just not standing up there, but I'm dealing with the same motivational issues, I'm dealing with the same storytelling issues. And so talk to me like an actor, and then we can communicate that way. It also depended on me to understand how an actor works, which goes back to yes. being in a room with a whole bunch of actors all the time and watching them work and learning from them. You know, it's a, it's a two-way conversation. You know, and I think it's, it's, too, it's too easy to put people in boxes, you know. It, 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 it's, a, it's a really simple thing. You know, I, I'm fascinated about, you know, the situation when you get into tech. Like, I love watching ensemble groups work. I do uh, some work with Fiasco Theater Company, too. And you get in, it is just collaboration, full on pedal to the metal when you're in rehearsal. Everybody sits and watch everyone works and they round robin themselves. It's thrilling to be in a room with. And the pace at which they go is extraordinary. Then strangely, when we were doing Into the Woods at the McCarter, all of a sudden it started, it started breaking down because now we had tech tables. And now we were 20 feet away from the edge of the stage and we were in the dark and they were in the light. And we, so, the thing I mentioned at the first production meeting, like anybody's got a note, anybody want to talk about something, take your headset off, and if I have an idea for lights, I walk over to the lighting table. If Chris Ackerlin has an idea, he comes over to my table. And if we want to talk to the actors on stage, I still do this as a designer to this day, is if there's something I need to communicate to an actor in the, in the tech situation, I get up from the table, I take my damn headset off, and I walk down and talk to the actor at the edge of the stage and turn around to my assistant or whoever is running sound and go, hey, play me this and talk the actor through the thing that I would love to try. Like, it, it is a lot about interface and how you talk to people and, and, and the conversations that you have. Another, and you have to yeah. work at it. It's hard to do, you know. Another interface that, training's quite different in other parts of the world. Um, in a lot of places, the performers and the designers are not trained in the same academies. So the way that they're training designers is they're making work. With them. It's more like performance art. So they're creating original pieces all the time. So for them, that's natural. Um, there's another way of um, not having a stage manager, which is where the, everybody on the crew watches the show and does their cues that if some leadership is needed, that is figured out and that can rotate. But it isn't people being able to read a book and hit a go button and not being invested that way, but keeping that alive and present in the room. Naomi. Um, going back to... Use your mic. Sorry. Going back to what you were saying before, because I just came out of uh, my thesis production where I realized afterwards, so my set designer was not 
in the room, and but I had a composer who was. And what ended up happening is my set designer turned into my projection designer because the set got created in rehearsal. And it was a really hard conversation. It was a colleague of mine who I've worked with forever. But my, I, I'm curious to hear what, like, how to get the designers in the room. I mean, we worked together for, we rehearsed for 10 months. So getting my set designer and my sound designer in the room, like my sound designer never even saw the show. Um, he was not your sound designer. She, she, she was not your sound was, designer. but well, and actually what happened is my composer who was in the room ended up being the sound designer. That's and who your sound designer my was. My sound designer ended up giving me a playlist yeah. for, yeah, but, but just how to actually do that because, you know, my set designer, my projection designer was working on five other shows. So like, I don't know how to get those people in the room. I, I think it actually goes back to what you were saying about we would never put up with that with actors and just and just changing of an expectation which which is a long process and 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 it's difficult but to but to have the expectation to start with that to to make it normal and and, and to and then when they are in the room to make sure that 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 they're empowered that that's really important that that once the designer is in the room the job is not finished <laughs> that you don't just let the designer be there. There's a whole set of things that need to be learned about how the group in the room is working, and that becomes the project. And, and that's, I mean, what ended up happening you know, with my composer, like... Yeah, it, yeah, of course. I mean, because they were such a part of the process, and I felt like my two designers out of the room, well, I, I would never do that again, but, but then I faced, like, potentially doing it myself, because mm -hmm. if I can't find mm -hmm. those designers, mm -hmm. I mean, that's just... Yeah, and to be fair, you know, we're, we're, we're in a closed system right now, what, what we're talking about. There's a lot of different designers who do a lot of things differently, and to me it sounds like that might not have been the perfect de set designer for your show. Or, or like if you're having, you know, that if they can't be in the room, no matter how much you love them, if you need them in the room, they may not be the designer, and you might be better off going with someone who can be in the room to make, the show you know there's i'm a very particular kind of designer and some directors don't want me in the room making noise and i don't work with those directors dan sullivan and i have a very interesting relationship because of that you know um that 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 i, I you know we we have it, it, we do it the old-fashioned way uh, uh, much to my chagrin but i love be i love watching his shows and being in tech with him so much i love doing the shows because i get a particular thing out of it too you know that that's the other side of this too is for me as a designer on top of uh, uh what you, the job that you're doing at hand you often get in situations that you think oh this is not an ideal design situation and then your job is to figure out why you're in the room and there is some reason why you're in the room it's either an actor's performance it's or integrating with you have to find something to keep you in the room and keep you active inside that inside that process but that's more Let's of a conversation with designers uh, i am a designer and i do dream of a, a process where i'm in the seat next to the director uh every night and, and as was said earlier, that often is impossible. Uh, when I go into a shop, uh, into my office, and I start drafting at 7.30 in the morning, and then staying through rehearsal that evening and keeping that kind of schedule throughout a six week period, it becomes very problematic. Uh, so uh, that frustrates me as well. Uh, I think another thing that came up that um, rang very true with me was the language of inclusion. And I think because I, uh, press this issue with my students at the University of New Orleans uh, daily. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not my show. It's right. the it's show. show. It's, it's our, it's the yeah. show. It's the design. Mm -hmm. uh, then, so when I hear language from directors that says, my show, my sound designer, my uh, lighting designer, my, you know, uh, it does, it kind of slaps me in the face. And I think that that's one thing that we can do to keep designers and invite designers in the room is when they are included and they feel part of the process. And, and it's simple things. It's just the way you say it that can, that can make all the difference in the world to an individual and, and the investment. 
uh, just huge. increases exponentially. And it is a huge right. thing. That kind of inclusion is also, I mean, was talking with someone who is at another session, but who's uh, at a college where he was worried about this pro problem, and he has a fantastic uh, resident lighting designer there, and he's invited him to provide the first uh, prompt for the production is to, to let the designer start sometime and to honor that um, as, as a creative generative artist. And that is something that I think is not so hard to model in, an, in a university setting. Try to pass the last thing you can do is, is question those students saying, what do you want? And ask them, well, you're in on this too. It's, I mean, the, the language of inclusion goes both ways. Mm -hmm. Goes saying to the designer, you're part of this. But also when young designers who think they're your servant, right? They're in that mode. So they say to me, what do you want for this moment? And I say, well, I don't know. What do you propose? What should we figure out? They go, you know, suddenly they have the artistic license. So it's helping them get out of that servantile habit. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I have this, <laughs> I, I have this rule, and I've talked to my assistants about this a lot, that any time I've ever been in a situation since the beginning of my career was that thing where a director will ask me, so what are you listening to and what are you thinking about for the show? Can you give me a CD? And I'm like, absolutely not. I, why am I going to give you a CD that is filled with music for you to take home and listen to possibly while you're working or possibly while you're making dinner after getting home from rehearsal that's not even in... Uh, in context of how I'm thinking about it inside the show. But you know what I will do is if you want to come in a little bit early tomorrow, we can play th through some things and talk about it in the rehearsal hall, not at a coffee shop, not at, you, you know, that you, you have to, um, that you have to establish sort of, sort of rules in my case, sometimes to actually provoke the, the conversations that you really, that you really, really want to have, you know? It, it definitely is a two, uh, you know, I've said this before, and I'll say it again, it's a two-way street, you know? <laughs> there will be some designers that won't, that want to be servants. That's totally fine. I know tons yeah, of them. Me too. Those aren't the people that any of us in this room are interested in working with, and let that happen at another panel about designers just sitting down and doing their jobs and coming to the, but that's not what we're talking about here. But those people exist, and... They can. I just happen to choose not to want to do that. Anne Bogart has this thing that she says about that question, what do you want? Because she says when somebody asks her that, she wants to go home. Right. And, and, it's and exhausting. She says it's totally what, what I want is, frankly, a little perverse and has nothing to do with the show. Right. So uh, <laughs> it, this is, if we're going to work on the show, it's about something else. <laughs> But, it, but it's also, you know, it, it's this idea of, I, I think a real important part of it, and, and we, we are kind of circling around it in various ways, is, is how do we start these relationships? How do we start these processes? And I mean, even, you know, like the thing of, let's start a conversation about the sound design that doesn't assume there's going to be one. I, I worked with a costume designer I work with a costume designer who I really, really enjoyed working with because she started every process that we would work on with the assumption that everyone's naked. Right. Right. My shows and, are in the dark and, until and, there's a reason they're, they're and then, not And dark. then you've got to have a reason. And, and it's, a, it's just as a way of talking, as like we're trying to make a play. It's not assumed that any of us are, it's right. not here about e right. uh, uh, me executing I've my I've had this agenda. happen with assistants who are sitting at the tech table and they get their new script and the next thing that they're working on, the first thing they do on first page, it goes, Q1, and inevitably I always go, how do you know? <laughs> <laughs> you haven't even been in rehearsal and this is your first read of this thing. There may be no Q at all. Mm -hmm. You know, don't make presumptions. Like, get in the room with the thing that you're making and working on and let it communicate what it wants. But you were talking about some very real strategies about how hard it can be to get in the room. It's like money and time. Money and time. Um, one of the things I've started to do is like bring, I still hand draft because I train physically, so I put it in the body, but I bring the drafting table into the room. I think it's really cool when I see people working with color and paint and swatches 
in the room, and, and it's not that hard to drag what I would be doing in my office into the room. And then, you know, in those breaks, you know, I think more important stuff in where making work happens on the breaks, and the meal breaks very often than what happens in rehearsal, right? So being able to have that kind of not loaded interface that can happen in the break when somebody's sort of casually like, what, what you doing? <laughs> or just looks over and sees that sort of, you know, the, the, your research materials, you know, getting them up on the wall in, in the room is, is, I think, so important and so useful. But there is a thing that, that is part of the professional reality now, which I think is, I think we have to name it, which is that a lot of people who are performers and directors do something else in addition to make money, and a lot of designers can kind of manage a career where by doing seven gazillion shows a year, that's uh, all they do. Okay. And I think, and especially in some of the younger ensemble world, where we're in the middle of that I, 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 situation. I actually have something to say about this. <laughs> that is entirely true, but you can buck the system, and I will tell you how is that the first three or four years I lived in New York, I was poor as a dormouse, like pulling change out of the milk jar to make sure I had enough money to get a token to get on the subway to get to a rehearsal. But if you do that one show with that director at the public or at New York Theater Workshop or wherever it may be, and you're in that rehearsal every single day or when you need to be there and you are an integral part to creating this thing, the next time they go to do a show, they're gonna want you there most likely if you have hit it off and you've, you know. So when that theater calls the next time, you go, yeah, okay, that's great. You got a freebie, but this time, you can't pay me the same amount of money you're paying the, the sound designer who comes in on the design day and you have a negotiation. And now you have the director on your side as well, who in many cases for me has called the theater and went, I don't care what you have to do. I want him in the room every single day. I don't want to have this conversation anymore. And they hang the phone up and you know what? Somebody figures it out. So it's also up to the designer to change how that system works. And for me, that, that's the, that is again, the way the, the that I... the challenge is that many young ensembles are self-presenting. Totally. And it's that, and it's that air, right? Yes, people are recognizing Yeah. That. Right. And so it's that, that little hub, you know, getting... Not little hub, that huge hub. It's yeah. getting over Within that. Within the attraction to doing that show, because I've done plenty of those, is the, is the love of the thing that you're making. I mean, we still work for free all the time. Just because we're working for free means that you need a certain kind of collaborator in that room with you. Even I do shows for free all the time, still. You know, but I am attracted to it for a very particular reason. And so usually that's about... I get to make something with someone that's new. Like the, 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 the potentials are still there, I think. So know, we're back to buy-in, which I think is a really good place for us to leave because we are at time. And so Ooh. I leave you with buy-in. Great. <laughs>